Hello and welcome back. Today we're doing a video on the Entity Framework and WCF. Now, if you haven't watched my videos about the Entity Framework and you're wanting to really learn how to use the Entity Framework, uh, please see the comments of this video. I put a link to the first video in that series and just watch the entire series. They're shorter videos and they take you from getting the source code through the create, update, and delete statements all the way to store procedures, functions, concurrency issues, all of that. Now they func that, or I should say they focus on an entity framework project and a Windows Forms project consuming that framework. Now in an enterprise, within the enterprise it's great, They're, that everything works great. But as we move into a distributed enterprise where you've got firewalls, and you've got different network architectures. Uh, we need a way to get the data from our back end. Now Entity Framework can talk to our database, which is a way we've set this project up. And also how to get this project in the comments too. The Entity Framework runs against a database. I've got it set up for concurrency like I covered in the Entity Framework concurrency video. We've got a new project in here called customers.wcf. You can imagine what that is. Uh, Windows Communication Foundation first debuted in .NET 3.0 and it's still alive and well today. Uh, we're using it here to distribute the data retrieved by our entity framework objects, convert them to data transfer objects, send them over the wire, i.e. serialize them over the wire to a consuming client and then do something with them on the consuming client. Now we're going to break this series up into a few videos because I don't want them to be too long each. The first one here covers how to get a list or how to perform basic get functions I guess I should say and pass data from behind the firewall through the firewall to the customer. Now please note that they don't necessarily have to be outside the firewall to use the WCF. They could be inside the firewall and still use the WCF service. But what you want to be careful of is how you architect your application. If they're inside the firewall and they are the enterprise, or they are you, the, com the company, and not some co customer that you're limiting their data access, then you may just want to use the entity framework and maybe you abstract it through a DLL business library and go directly like that. Save some of the performance of the XML. Now WCF is fast, supports compression. Um, there is the natural question of Dean, why aren't you using Web API? Uh, guess what my next video series is about. <laughs> uh, but this one's a good old fashioned WCF. Uh, proven, proven technology. Uh, I use it, I would say, at least monthly, and it works great. So let's dive right into it here. Like I said, we had an NT Framework project. We have a customer's database. That customer's database has two tables in it. It has, if I look over here at my server explorer, We, it's the same database that we used in the Entity Framework video series, Customers Who've Made Purchases. Customers is simply the customer with a name. Purchases is the customer's ID with the purchase date, amount, and its own ID primary key value. Concurrency is set up on the customer name via the concurrency mode fixed on the purchase date and the amount. And if we right click and we go to model browser. We can go here and look at complex types. Select clients. This is our store procedure that we brought down. Functions. Which functions we've mapped to. If we go over here we can look and see that there's a store project select clients. There are functions. Average purchases. So we can go down through a model and we can see uh, that it will give us different uh, outputs which we covered in the Entity Framework at great detail of what these mean and what they do. 
So if you haven't checked those videos out again, check them out. So we're going to use these uh, as we go through this series. And I want to go ahead and say, why not? Now, on top of the Entity Framework layer, we've added a new layer called WCF. This is how we will communicate with the world. In it, there's a single service. So all I did was I went to File, Add New Project, WCF Application. Called it Customers.WCF and added a WCF service. I'll show you how I did that. Right click, go to Add New Item. And you just select Web. WCF service and give it a name. We're not going to do it, but that's how you do it. <clears throat> when you do that, it's going to add a customer service object and the interface to go with it. Now, the service object itself is not too terribly interesting. All it is is code that interacts with the entity framework. Now we'll go through this code a little bit, but first, when any time you write a WCF object or a Web API object or any kind of object in which you're going to expose data to the world, you need to bust out a notepad and a piece of paper. Or if you're a Visio whiz, bust out Visio and decide what data and what capabilities do you want to make available to the world? In this case, we have two tables, customers and purchases, and we want to allow the customer, whoever they are, to hit our web service, or in this case, our WCF service, and get a list of all of the customers and all of their purchases for research purposes. Let's just assume. So what we need to do is we need to come in here and we need to define in the iCustomer service, it will create this file for you. We need to define a service contract and say, you know what? We want to expose to the world an operation contract, a function that returns a list of customer objects. Now, note, these are not the entity framework customer objects. They are stupid objects. They don't know how to interact with the database. They don't know anything about your database. They are these customer objects. It's going to expose a function called get customers with purchases. Then you need to, or you could do this first, write those classes, which I've done. And I do it all in one file usually uh, because I, I like to keep my services small. My services perform a job and the data they return. Now if it's going to be reusable, I'll put a contracts folder and an interfaces folder, but uh, for purpose of these classes, it would do nothing but muck up the, the message. Uh, we have customers and purchases. A little bit of hand coding here. They're data contracts, meaning that they're going to tell the consuming client what this class looks like so that you have a strongly typed class. Notice through the parent class, the customer class, I was able to put its ID and its name and a list of the purchases that person's made. I just had to define what a purchase class was. And we're good to go. So, in the service, you might imagine, using the Entity Framework, I'm going to have to do a couple of things, right? I'm going to have to fetch the Entity Framework objects that are the representations of the customers and purchases. Then I'm going to have to convert those Entity Framework objects into these data contract objects and then serialize these across the wire to the customer. Now, if they performed an update or we allowed them, we added a function for update customer, then we would accept one of these. I mean, uh, let me show you how that would look. You just you would go in here and do an operation contract, and you'd come in here, and you would say, uh, uh, customer. I can't seem to type customer. And that would expose it to the world, and they would be able to see it. Now, you have to come up here to your customer, implement the interface, I right-click it. Because notice, just because I put it in that class, it doesn't show here. I'm going to right-click, 
and I'm going to implement that interface and it will add that function here. Now if they call it, it's going to throw an exception because we haven't defined it yet. I'll leave that there because it will be there in future videos. Okay, so that explains how this data contract and the service contract work. Service contracts nothing but an explanation to the world of what you're going to allow them to do. The data contracts an explanation to the world of what they're going to get back from your WCF service. Pretty simple stuff. Now this is just standard uh, entity framework, link, and c -sharp programming. What we do is when they call our get customers with purchases, we're going to go out and we're going to create a new list. Notice these customer objects are our data transfer objects. There are results, a buffer if you will. And then we're going to use the entity framework, customers entities, context, and we're going to go through that context. And for every one of the customers in it, we're going to add them to our buffer right here. And then we're going to say, look, if the last one in the list, which we just added it, so we know what the last one in the list is, if it has any purchases, because remember, Link gives us this for almost nothing, then we're going to go ahead and add them as children. Now, you say, Dean, why did you do this? Well, it's interesting because in the data contracts, the children objects, you don't want a null reference exception. This is null until I initialized it here. Now, some people would come in and say, Dean, we could have got really fancy with our link and probably have done it in a statement. Uh, we, my argument to that would be we probably could have done it in two statements. Um, but as much as we like to show off, it's important that we write code that an entry-level programmer, because remember, the people that go to the bug-fixing team are usually your entry-level programmers. It's important that we write code that they can read and they can fix if there's something wrong. And so as much as we would like to get really, really cool and do some really, really neat stuff, I tell team members on my team, pull back a little bit, make it readable. And this is really, really readable. They can step through it. Okay? Now let's see it in action. I have a Windows application in here. It's got a Windows form on it. I have added a service reference to my customer service. And you say, well, how did you do that, Dean? Well, you go to service references and you go to add new service reference. Um, and when it goes to add service reference, uh, you'll see it there. Click the discover button and you'll see it. I don't want it to blow up. I s click it, discover. There it is. I click on it. I can even see the functions in it. The customer service, or what comes back there. It is. It hasn't updated because I haven't built. Uh, I'm going to hit cancel. I'm going to go ahead and build my project. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you the app run. Because the form is nothing but a Windows form. And it did it again. I love how Visual Studio 13 has been doing this to me. Move my form to the bottom right of the screen. Very annoying. But I have on my data sources, once you add your service reference, you'll have in your data sources window your customer service. And you can change from grid to details view, uh, labels, names, uh, data grid view, so I don't use any Dev Express stuff. Uh, and be able to go through here and do whatever. Okay, so we're going to go through here, we're going to debug, and we're going to show you what we see. When I hit load, all we do is we open our service reference, we set the data source to the binding source. All I did to get that binding source is I drug this customer onto the form, right? Drug the customer onto the form. Set its data source. The service get get customers with service purchases. I could have gone here, 
And notice if I go here and I hit SVC dot, um, we added one. It's got an async call to it, it adds by default, but we added one and it was update, right? See how we don't see the update? It doesn't show up. And you say, well, what do we do there, Dean? Well, in disconnected programming like this, you have to go in here and update your reference. So we've updated our service reference. There's our update customer. Pretty easy stuff. So we've got that now. And you have to forgive a little bit of the noise. we got people over it Sunday. Saturday, I mean. Okay. So let's run it again. Start without debugging. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you. Now we hit load, and it's going to come back with all of our customers and their purchases. And it's all coming through the WCF layer. Now a trick I can show you is you don't need a Windows app to test the WCF service. I can right click this WCF service and I can go over here and I can say look set this WCF service as the startup project. Okay? And then I'm going to go here into this function in the customer service. I'm going to insert a breakpoint and I'm going to debug using Internet. See how this has changed Internet Explorer? I'm going to debug Okay. Notice how the async aren't available. We don't care about those. If you're if you're going to be doing a lot of async stuff, don't use WCF. Use Web API. Um, but we're going to test our function: get customers with purchases. It doesn't take any parameters because we're sending them all back. But if it did, it would list them here, and you'd fill them out. And away we go. I'm going to say invoke, and it's going to give you a security warning. You're going to say okay. And you can debug through it if you wanted. I am just going to hit F5 and go all the way through this. And there is our customers and their purchases. So you can see the results. I'll just send them back. And you can even see the XML if you wanted to. Okay. Now, let's look at the one we wrote that we know is going to throw an exception. Updated update customer. We didn't implement this one yet, but we exposed it to the world because that would be stupid programming. We're going to invoke. We're going to say, okay. Boom. They're an exception. So we'll have to write that one. I'll write it for you. Stop debugging. Okay. So that covers how to get objects through the WCF. Now, one thing I do want to point out, and it's important that you know if you're sticking around, and I'll put it in the comments, but notice that our entity framework has the customer's database. In our web.config, we have a connection string too, and I've commented it for the customer's entity database, where it is. It says it's in the data folder, local DB. It's in the data directory, customer's MDF. That means it's setting here. So this is a real good approximation of a production environment. And what that means is, is that in reality, you would compile it in dev or test or whatever, this database you made changes to, and then you propagate those structural or data or whatever changes up to a production, which is where this database is. So just remember, if you make changes to the code here, and you update your model, that you also uh, you may have to close Visual Studio and reopen it to clear the logs, but you copy this customer's database over here into the app data folder so that your WCF project can reference it. Okay? Well, hopefully this has helped, and I ask that you please subscribe. Uh, click that subscription button or the link on the screen. I showed it in the beginning. I showed it at the end. Uh, leave comments. Uh, follow the links to the other training videos I've got up. There'll be a Quite a few more on WCF. We'll do some uh, AP, uh, sorry, Web API with Entity Framework. And thanks for stopping by.